And now we are going to hear from Brian Schleining. Brian is a senior software engineer in the research and development division at Embari. Um, he's going to be telling us more about the FathomNet interface, how to log in, um, probably address many of the questions that are in the uh, in the chat right now. Um, Brian has worked on numerous projects involving video and image analysis, video annotation, numerical analysis, user interface development, and data management systems at Ambari for more than 25 years. Uh, most recently, he's been the brains behind the back end of FathomNet and will now give us a tour of the FathomNet website and many other interactive features. So I'll turn it over to Brian. Great. Thank you, Katie. And uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you for attending our workshop. This is a real treat to be able to present our work to you. Um, I've already been introduced. So again, I'm going to be talking about the website and the application programming interface. And as Kikani has already mentioned, uh, this is a beta software. We are in development and we do have, we have gotten a lot of feedback. We do have a lot of features that we're working on, although they're not published out yet. But what's important is we want to get feedback from you so we can help improve our website and uh, make a better tool for the whole community. Um, we do have a site where we are collecting feedback. So if you are on GitHub, you can go to github.com at Fathomit. There's a repo called Community Feedback, and you can enter feedback as issues there. So what I'll be talking about today is just briefly going over the Fathomit concepts and architecture so you understand what's underneath the hood of Fathomit. I'll give you a tour of the website to show you all the features and how it works. And then um, I'm going to talk about the data schema just briefly so that if you do write some code, for example, using uh, Kevin's um, Python API, you understand a little bit of how the data is structured and modeled. So the Fathomit architecture is super simple. The idea is that a group has images and they host them on a web server and make that web server, those images um, public to the world through that web server. Then uh, they can submit the location of those images and the localization to FathomNet, and we store that information in a database, which we expose to the world through our web API. And a web API is a standard practice. It's really easy to write all kinds of software to it. You can write any program in language basically to interact with the FathomNet API. The FathomNet website itself is a web application that runs in your browser. And just a few important concepts I'm going to cover now. First, we are not another annotation tool. I'll talk more about that. I want to give you a, a really concrete idea of what we mean by bounding boxes and localizations. And then I'm going to introduce the concept of taxonomy providers. Now, the intended lifecycle of Fathom is we weren't really, our goal wasn't to create another annotation tool. There's fantastic tools out in the community. And we, we encourage you to keep using those tools. However, one thing I would encourage for those people who are working, say you're using Beagle or Squiddle or whatever your tool is, is we are discussing with them integrations with Fathomit, but it would be really helpful for them to know if that's important to you. The more people that tell them it's important, the faster that work will get done. So we encourage you to lean on them a little bit. Anyway, you can annotate with your preferred tool, export those out, that data out um, as bounding boxes and import those into Fathomit. Once that data is in Fathomet, there are some lightweight annotation tools that you can use to refine these annotations. For example, uh, you might be a specialist in squids and you may look at the 62 that's gonna say, well, actually, I know the species of this and you could correct that in Fathomet if you have sufficient permissions. Now, when we talk about localization, we're very specific about what we mean. Uh, it's a description of what was seen in the image and it's kind of mentioned uh, a bounding box around uh, the object that's being labeled. We use an image co coordinate system, and the origin of the system is the upper left corner, uh, plus X is to the right, plus Y is down, um, and then we have the width and height of the bounding box, and this is all in pixels. Now, underneath that, we have this idea of taxonomy providers. Uh, the idea is that we didn't really want to constrain what people name things. There are a lot of ideas out there. Um, there's you know, standard classical taxonomy, there's Katami codes, there's smarter ID, there's different morpho taxes types. And we want to be able to plug in different providers if they had APIs. So currently we have three that are plugged in. We have Ambari's knowledge base, uh, which is good for the California West Coast. We have the worms. 
straight to the Worms API, uh, which is a little uh, fragile because we're abusing their API in ways it wasn't meant to be used. And then we have the Fathom that's uh, taxonomy provider, which is a subset of the Worms data, um, and it's customized for work working with Fathomnet. So it's a fast, robust uh, taxonomy provider. And the way these work is, uh, if you do a search, you say, well, I want to use a taxonomy provider. When you go to click the search button, you'll see this little uh, pop-up up here. You know, there's two options, exact match and all descendants. And you say, well, I just want an exact match. I want to search just for things that are labeled Bathocordaeus, you know, genus Bathocordaeus. And that's all I want. That's great. It'll return your search results that, and match that term exactly. And you'll get, in this case, 1,300 results. Or you could say, well, I actually want to extend that search. I want to train this model on all types of Bathocordaeus. So you could say, all right, I'm going to search for Bathocordaeus using Fathomnet taxonomy provider. And what will happen under the hood is it will take that genus, expand out, walk the tree, and grab all the different types of Bathocordaeus, expand the search out to all those types, and then return the matching results. And in this case, we now get 3,300 results. And so with that, I'm going to give you a, a nice little tour of the website. So bear with me one second. Okay. So this is the Fathomet website. And when you land here, um, first thing you'll notice is nice prominent search box. And this will appear in different parts of the website. And I I'll cover this in a moment, but I'm gonna scroll down the page a little bit to get to the middle. Just to show you our current statistics, um, we currently have 175,000 localizations and 84,000 images, and we have 340 contributors. And these contributors are actually the names of people who have annotated. So if, when you submit annotations, you can say who have made the observation. So 340 different people have created annotations that live in Fathomnet. So we're not quite where we want to be, but we're slowly working our way towards uh, the idea of thousands of localizations per animal in worms. Okay, I just clicked on the Explorer tab. Let me go back just to show you what I did again. I'm going to the Explorer button right here, clicking on that. Uh, it'll take you to this page with that same search bar there. And we're just gonna run a few quick searches to show you how this works. So we're gonna go to Bathos because that is a very popular animal in the database and we'll run a search for it. And what this brings up is all the matches. So we have our 1300 results. And if those images have uh, latitude and longitude, they'll appear on the map. And if you click on that, it'll show you the corresponding image there. And these images are all paged. So you can scroll down to the bottom and page through images if you want to browse them. And I'm going to move this. And then once you have um, found all the results you want. You can click select all here and, or just select manually select the image you want for your training set and click the download button. And this will download the data as uh, structured data as JSON. And that JSON looks like, bear with me one second as I try to escape out of full screen. Um, it's just uh, text data that you can read and easy to parse in a variety of, of uh, programming languages and has all the information about the bounding boxes. And I'm not gonna cover this in detail. I just wanted to show you a little snippet of what that looks like. Okay. So now um, we do have other constraints you can add for your searches. Uh, I know someone posted in chat about um, searching in uh, uh, just specific regions, you can do that. You could say, all right, I just want to search in the Gulf of California, if I can spell Gulf of California. And in this case, it will constrain the search by a region. So this will return all the localizations in a region. So if you want to train a module model for a specific area, you can constrain that. And these all add together. So I can say, well, I just want the Bath of Cordaeus in the Gulf of California. You can do that. And then I might say, well, all right, I, I want to expand the search out to get all the different types of Bathocordaeus, and I can select a taxonomy provider. And again, now the pop-ups change. You see exact match, all descendants, which we'll select. And that didn't change the results because there are only 19 there. So we'll remove the region. We'll rerun our search. And that will give us 3,300 results. 
Now, there are additional constraints here as you're browsing around trying to find the data that are interesting to you. Uh, you can search between dates. Uh, we do have a field called imaging type. Right now, the only imaging type we have listed is ROV, but we recognize that people may submit uh, images that may be some type of microscopy, maybe black and white images, or some other uh, you know, different type of imaging cameras. So a way to record that information here and allow people to constrain their searches by it. Um, you can also constrain by owner institution who actually owns the images. And then, of course, there's verification status, which uh, we touched on briefly during the question session. Um, the idea is here is that when you submit an image, uh, initially it's unverified. And at some point, someone will go through who has sufficient permissions and they can say, yes, this is indeed um, uh, Bathocardias, for example. And I'll show you a little bit more details about that in a second. Okay. All right, so right now, oh, I'm gonna sign out. Um, you can do all these exploration functions signed out. And I'm gonna click on an image and show you, this is a single image that I clicked on in the, in the, the grid there. Uh, this image is verified, it means in this case, Kakani has gone through and said, yes, these localizations are correct. I'm sure she probably made these localizations too. And this image browser right here, uh, if you just see there's a several bounding boxes, if you hover over the label on the side, it'll show you which label it corresponds to. In this case, they're all the same label. So it's not particularly exciting. And now we're gonna go back. I'm gonna change something. Now I'm gonna sign in. So right now, when you sign in, uh, the only provider we have wired in right now is Google. Uh, we are looking at uh, having other authentication providers logged in, but for right now, you need a Google account. So I'm just gonna log in. And I have, um, well, I'm the admin, so I have permissions to do anything on the website, but what I'll be demonstrating here is if you had moderator positions, if you were allowed to uh, make changes in FathomNet. And what I'm doing is I'm just clicking on the image and it'll switch over to the editor. Now that I'm in the editor as an, a, a moderator, I can select these annotations and I can modify them. I can move the boxes around. I can uh, change the label to something else if I wanted to, um, like that. Um, and so I do have permissions to make those changes. And, and you can also add annotations. So I just click on the add annotation button here. It'll put a new box and I can move it, resize it and um, call it whatever I want. Okay. I'm gonna go back to the image details and not save my changes right now. Oh, actually while I'm in this, uh, at the bottom, there are also these arrows. So you can navigate through your, your search image set just by clicking on these arrows. And it'll move from image to image like so. OK, let's go back to image details. And now I'm going to go back to the Explorer view for a second uh, just to show you one more thing. Uh, if I click on one that has a position, if the data, if this uh, image does have latitude, longitude, et cetera, that information will appear so you can see that information. We also can store some of the temperature pressure, but that won't be displayed by default in the website. In addition, uh, each image may belong to some collections. Actually, before I go to that, I just wanna mention one more thing about the login process. When you log in the first time, um, uh, you will have read-only permissions. You will not be able to submit data to FathomNet and you will not um, be able to make changes. Right now, the process to get elevated permissions is you would send an email to FathomNet at embari.org and ask for elevated permissions. And we do have a document describing this that we'll link to later. Um, and just say, hey, I'd like to submit data to FathomNet or hey, this is my background. I would like to be able to edit and add additional localizations to FathomNet. 
All right. Now, back to collections. There's a little field here called collections. Now, an image may belong to more than one collection. In this case, it's a single collection. And if you click on that, it will take you to that collection page that will show you all the images in that particular collection and any Darwin core metadata that belong to the image that were submitted with the collection. And again, if I now that I've clicked on a collection, if I select an image and um, again, there's these next and previous errors at the bottom, this will just walk me through the images in that collection and be warned that it's now what you've searched for in the Explorer. It's just showing the results from this particular collection. Okay. So let's say you're interested in submitting data to Fabnet. So the first step, of course, is you log in. And then once you've logged in, uh, you'll see a little, if you go to the homepage, you'll see your little um, avatar that from Google appear in the corner. If you click on that, it'll take you to your profile page. If you would like elevated permissions, or even if you're a scientist that are interested in working with Fabnet and us more, please take a moment to fill out some areas here. Uh, there's some fields for work, for example, your organization, and this one is your position, job title. So fill those in and a little bit about you and your expertise so that we know something about that you. So that way, when you do ask for hand, say, hey, I'd like to submit data or I'd like to make changes, we know who you are. Um, while I'm here, there's one other bit you should be aware of. If you're using the Fathomet API, um, you might need the API key if you want to make changes to uh, some data in Fathomet. So in your account, you can just go to the API key uh, tab here, click on this generate, and it'll generate API key that you can use um, to work with the Fathomet API. If you want a new key, it's easy enough to get rid of your old key and regenerate a new key. All right. Now you might be wondering, well, how do I submit data to Fathomnet? And I'll talk about this in much more detail in the Marine Scientist Breakout, but just a brief overview is there's a, um, a link at the top called My Collections. And if you click on that, it'll take you to this page that shows you all the collections of data that you may have submitted or not have submitted yet. Um, and if this is blank, that's okay, don't worry about it. But here, there'll be a button that says add collection. And if you click on that, it'll take you to this page where you can upload a CSV file. Now, when you upload the CSV file, you also have to submit additional metadata to describe your data set. And we follow the Darwin Core metadata standard. So there's a number of fields that are pre-filled in based on your information already. And then at the bottom, there's optional fields that you could also add information about. And if you have a question about what any of these are, you can just click on it and it will take you to the appropriate link in the Darwin core. Oops. And bear with me while I wrestle with full screen mode again. Okay. Once you've filled in all the metadata you feel is appropriate for your data set, as you go to the bottom, there's just a place to say, select the CSV file, comma, separated value text file that describes your localizations. You click on that, and then you can upload um, your data to Fathnet. Once it's uploaded, it generally takes a few minutes to process, and then it will be available through Fathomnet. Sounds easy. Uh, and again, if you need more details, come to my breakout session. I will talk in much more detail about this. Now, a little bit about the data itself. Um, I'm going to click on the About Us link at the top, and this describes Fathomnet's terms of use. And I'll go straight to the terms of use section. If you do submit images to Fathomnet, this describes the rights that you are giving to people for these images. For the most part, images in Fathomnet are well, let's start with the annotations. Annotations are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution No Derivative International License. It's a pretty freeform license that allows people to use the annotations for a variety of purposes. The images, however, 
are under a slightly modified license. They are under also under Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, international license. However, they are for specific purpose. Oops. They are for training and development of machine learning algorithms for commercial, academic, or government purposes. So as long as people are using the images for those purposes open only, it's okay. If they want to use them for any other purpose, uh, advertising, uh, education, whatever, um, they need to co contact the original copyright holder and they can obtain that information through the collections links that are provided with each image. Uh, in addition to that, we do have a couple other uh, terms. Um, if you do use images from FathomNet, please acknowledge FathomNet in your publication or project. Uh, if you do any kind of enrichment, say you say, hey, I, I, this is great, and I developed this great novel way to use data from FathomNet, that's fantastic, and we encourage that. Uh, we would like to be able to share your work through our social channels to help spread the word around. And then finally, um, we do we are following the benevolent use the data. This data will only be used in ways that are consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And if you wonder what those are, you can just click on the link and and read the, the goals there. Okay, well that was the FoundNet website, and I'm going to return now to my presentation. Okay, so we're returning back to our API diagram, and I'm going to discuss just a little bit about the database and web API now and give you an overview of the data structure. We have a very, very simple database schema. If you don't know database schemas, that's fine. Uh, I'll tell you what everything is here. Um, the core of FathomNet is that we are basically an image browser for machine learning. We store information about pictures. Within each picture, we have boxes to describe what people see in the image. We provide tags as a flexible way to store information that we did not plan for. So if, for example, you are recording quantum flux with your images and you want to attach it to your images in FedMet, you can do it. You can, we have key value pairs that you can attach any kind of information you want to an image. And getting a little more specific, um, we point at images to a URL. So the image can live anywhere on the World Wide Web. It does not have to be hosted at FathomNet. We do store location and uh, salinity, temperature, depth, oxygen, information with the images if you provide it. And for naming, we have that, we, our, our primary name is called a concept. Um, instead of names or label, we just say this is the concept that's we're describing. We also have a field called alt concept. This is the alternate concept. Primarily, we've been using that for labeling organism parts. So for example, we may say, here's a whole nanomia, but here's just the nectosome of an anomia. And so the concept would be nomia. The alt concept would be nectosome. We track a lot of names in our database. We tracked who made the observation. We track who verified or confirmed the name in, of the observation. We track who uploaded the data, and then we also track who owns the images. And all this information is available through the API and can be downloaded when you download information from FathomNet. Our API is fully documented, so it's there. If you're a programmer, have at it. Um, we have different flavors for if you like different flavors of documentation. I've linked one at the bottom. That's fathomnet.org. 8080 slash swagger UI. And that is my presentation. So if there's any questions, now's the time. Thanks, Brian. We do have a few minutes for questions. Um, there's one already in the chat. Are any of those image metadata fields required? Uh, 
The only fields that are required are the, either the URL to the image uh, concept, and even what you're describing, and the coordinates of the bounding box, the X, Y, width, and height. Everything else is optional. Great. Um, can you drop that link here in the chat? Brandy, do you mean the fat, just the FathomNet website or a different link? to the API at the end. Can you put that yes. link in the chat, Brian? Yep, give me one second. Awesome, thanks. Now I gotta say after all this time with COVID, you'd think I'd be used to giving Zoom chats, but it still feels weird. There's always a surprise. So what kind of experience would be required to be able to get access to verify or upload images or code to mm -hmm. the open source platform? So it sounds like what are, you know, what are the requirements to do different things? That, that's Uploading a great images question. versus verifying versus contributing to the code. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And it's a bit of a loaded one. Uh, right now, unfortunately, we're a bit of, we're gatekeepers. Um, you would submit an email to us and just ask for it. And then we would, um, you know, look at your background, talk to people we know in the community and say, yeah, this is a good guy or a good person. Um, they can make changes, sure. Um, but we are working on different ways to do that. And that is a, an open question that we are working on. Is there an obvious way to do that on the website? Like, is there a form to fill out? Say, I would like to verify. Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> not Tomorrow yet. there will be. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow there might be. <laughs> um, but what about uploading images? That's open, right? So, Im uh, okay, so upload images, th this is a little loaded right now. Mm -hmm. The way we designed it was we thought, well, people would host their own images because they own them and they would want to have control of them and they would submit the CSV that points the images to fathom it. It turns out that's uh, been a challenge for many people. Um, a lot of organizations, you know, like universities have really restrictive sharing policies and it's been a problem for labs to share those images. So right now we're working with NOAA, we set up a memorandum of understanding with them um, and we've entered the technical phase to set up a pipeline where you can actually submit a zip file of images with the CSV and those will be staged on a server somewhere and NOAA will actually archive those images and make them publicly available for 75 years for us and for you, but that's not in place yet. That's a, a work in progress. Great. Um, how do we, great question from Gustav, how do we handle disagreements in identification? Uh, <laughs> we, uh, that's a great question. Um, that's something we've gone back and forth with quite a bit. And I think Kakani, you're gonna be presenting on that on the last day. So we have some thoughts on it, but again, that is not something that's fully flushed out. Um, we do have some uh, bits to present to you about that though. Okay. Great. We realize that's gonna be a problem. I, I, will, I will add like, you know, we wanna be clear that we don't wanna be gatekeepers. Like we want the community to help us with that process, right? And so we've got some new user interfaces that we've been talking about incorporating into the um, website to help handle disagreements. Um, but at the end of the day, we want the community to tell us how they would prefer those disagreements to be handled. Great. One last question before we move on to Ben uh, from Elva. Are we removing water from the annotated underwater images? Uh, no. Um, I think part of the idea with the machine learning is it, it depends on your use case, of course, but you want to have a variety of images. Um, because let's say like you're Kakani and you're out running the sub in various conditions. Well, you, you want, if you remove the water from the images then you're gonna have to do the same thing, pre-process the video before in real time, before you can use it for tracking. So the idea is that um, you wanna, again, train on a variety of images and you want that water there. Great, thanks, Brian. Thank you so much. And we will please feel free to continue putting questions in the chat and in the Q&A and the team will, will try to keep up with those as best as we can.